And so, as, uh, as you know, the main emphasis of our work and of the center is to recruit young people and give them opportunities to do great research in this environment. So we thought it's appropriate that we end today with a presentation by one of our young researchers. Uh, William East did his uh, PhD at Princeton, then went to Stanford, uh, came to Perimeter uh, a couple of years ago as a director's fellow, and he's going to tell us about the frontier of gravitational waves. Okay. Uh, so first, just on a personal note, I'd like to say I think these uh, new fellowships are really great and aptly named. Uh, I myself uh, came to Perimeter uh, a little over a year ago, uh, supported by a similar type fellowship. So uh, I'm really hopeful that uh, this will entice some uh, great new researchers to come join us here. So I want to tell you a little bit about some of the breakthroughs that have been made recently in the field of gravitational wave astronomy and uh, why uh, those of us in the community who study extreme gravity are especially excited about the new window into the universe that gravitational waves provide. So this whole field of uh, gravitational wave astronomy uh, got kicked off uh, just about two years ago when uh, LIGO, the Laser Interferometer Gravitational Wave Observatory, uh, made uh, a first new detection, uh, both in their instrument in Hanford, Washington and Livingston, Louisiana. So what is that sound? Uh, it's actually an audio rendering of the gravitational wave signal that was detected uh, by the LIGO instruments. Uh, first at the frequency that the gravitational waves were actually detected, and then shifted to slightly higher frequencies that allows you to hear this increasing in pitch, this chirp sound. And that chirp sound actually comes from an event that occurred 1.3 billion years ago, where two black holes, each of about uh, 30 times as massive as the sun, uh, orbited around each other, plunged together and merged and created a, a bigger black hole. And this is really the inauguration of a uh, completely new way of looking out into our universe using gravitational waves that allows us to see gravity at its most extreme. So uh, when I say extreme gravity, you know, I'm not talking about uh, when you drop an object here on Earth and it falls to the ground. Uh, the gravity here on Earth is actually quite weak. So one way that you can uh, quantify this is to you know, ask how fast do you need to launch a rocket or otherwise escape the Earth's gravitational pull. And that so-called escape velocity for the Earth is about 11 kilometers per second. Now that sounds pretty fast, uh, but the thing to compare it to is the speed of light, which is actually 30,000 times faster. So instead, uh, let's consider a more exotic object a neutron star. A neutron star is what you get when you take all the mass of the sun and compress it down to a region about the size of Toronto. Uh, so these very exotic objects uh, actually play an important role in uh, gravitational waves. And the escape velocity from the surface of a neutron star is about half the speed of light. So compared to a neutron star, we really only know of one object that's uh, more compact, where gravity is even more extreme and that's a black hole. Uh, black holes are formed, for example, when massive stars uh, collapse down, and with nothing to stop the gravitational collapse, they just get uh, more and more compact. Uh, and black holes don't have surfaces you can stand on, uh, but at the boundary of a black hole, the escape velocity is actually equal to the speed of light. And since nothing can travel faster than the speed of light, uh, inside a black hole, space-time is so strongly curved uh, that nothing can escape. So gravitational waves uh, actually allow us to see the movement and dynamics of these strongly gravitating objects. Uh, gravitational waves are sourced when these massive objects uh, are orbiting and moving close to the speed of light. So what I'm showing you here is actually uh, animation of a computer simulation of two black holes uh, orbiting and merging, uh, like the first LIGO event. And you can see that each time the black holes trade places, you get one of these green oscillations, which are actually the gravitational waves. As the black holes circle uh, closer and closer, move faster and faster, you get stronger gravitational waves at higher frequencies. 
Uh, and then finally they merge and form one bigger black hole. And you get these gravitational waves, these ripples in space-time that propagate outward uh, at the speed of light. Uh, so what does it mean for a gravitational wave to be a ripple in space-time? So this, is, this little animation is to illustrate what would happen if we had a gravitational wave uh, coming in this direction uh, at us here at perimeter. So what you actually get is a, a stretching of space in one direction and a squeezing in the perpendicular direction. And the squeezing and stretching alternates as the crests and trials of the gravitational wave pass through. And so this, of course, is actually a, a, a gross exaggeration. Uh, the changes in length that, for example, a gravitational wave detector like LIGO uh, would measure are something like one part in 10 to the 21, which is a mind-bogglingly small number. You know, it's something like measuring the distance to a nearby star system to within the width of a human hair. So it's really an a, uh, amazing feat of engineering uh, that we're able to do this. So this past August, uh, we learned that there was an amazing uh, new type of detection that was made by LIGO, and that is the detection of two neutron stars merging. Uh, so that's what this uh, uh, plot here shows. Uh, and again, you can see, you know, sort of by eye, the signal uh, from all the noise. It's this increasing frequency uh, as time passes, as the neutron stars uh, orbit each other faster and faster and get closer and closer. Uh, and so this event was especially exciting, uh, not only because it was the first detection of this kind, uh, but because all the astronomers got involved and pointed their telescopes at the same direction in the sky uh, from which this gravitational wave signal was coming. Uh, and they actually saw light uh, across the entire spectrum. You know, that's going from the highest energy and highest frequency type of light, uh, gamma rays, to X-rays, to the visible spectrum of light, uh, to radio waves. Uh, so we can go in along with sort of the sound of the gravitational waves, we really uh, saw this in dynamic color. Uh, to make an analogy with uh, medical imaging, you know, this neutron star is really uh, subjected to a full battery of scans from your CT scan to your MRI uh, to your ultrasound. So we got a complete picture. And uh, these multi-messenger observations uh, actually provided some important information to address uh, some long-standing astrophysical mysteries. Uh, for example, when astronomers look out into the sky, uh, they periodically see these very intense bursts of gamma rays, uh, the most energetic type of light, that last about uh, two seconds or less. And an outstanding puzzle has been, uh, where do these so-called short gamma ray bursts come from? It must be some sort of powerful and, and rapidly occurring event. Uh, and so actually following the gravitational wave signal from this neutron star murder that occurred in August, uh, a short gamma ray burst was detected uh, from the, the same direction in the sky. And so the coincidence of these two observations was actually the smoking gun to tell us that in fact, uh, neutron star mergers are uh, an origin for short gamma ray bursts. Another uh, astrophysical mystery that's been long-standing is uh, where do all the heavy elements come from, including our favorite shiny metals like gold and platinum? So we don't actually have the uh, conditions on Earth to create these. And for a while, it was thought that maybe they're uh, created when stars collapsed and went supernovae. Uh, but actually, using this, this observation of a neutron star merger, uh, we now have pretty good evidence that the heaviest elements, you know, including your, fo your favorite gold ring, uh, actually come from the violence of two neutron stars merging and some of the incredibly dense material of the star uh, getting torn off, uh, like is shown here on the left, and flung out into the wider universe. Uh, so it turns out that these neutron star mergers are not figuratively, but they're literally gold. Uh, and so in this, this new era of gravitational wave astronomy, I feel strongly that you know, there are many more discoveries yet to be made. Uh, my particular research is focused on theoretical understanding of uh, the dynamics of strong gravity. And a number of us uh, here at Perimeter are especially excited about using this new tool of gravitational waves uh, to ask fundamental questions about the universe. Uh, for example, we want to use it to search for new types of particles uh, that may form around black holes and emit gravitational waves. We want to use it to understand the incredibly high densities uh, inside neutron stars and what matter does at such high densities that we have no access to using labs here on Earth. 
Uh, we want to challenge our understanding of gravity using these gravitational wave observations as a ever more stringent test and perhaps look for clues to a more fundamental theory. Uh, and we want to uh, you know, look back in time and perhaps uh, catch a glimpse of the earliest evolution of the universe. Uh, so there are you know, a number of other avenues for exploration and perhaps ch uh, chances for nature to surprise us uh, as we you know, continue forward in this age of gravitational wave astronomy. And uh, I think Perimeter and this, this new center uh, will definitely play an important role in that. So thank you.